Supervisor Cavanaugh, would you like to do that? All right. And for those that would like to participate in the invocation and the pledge, please stand. Thank you, Father God, that you had your hand in the founding of this nation, God, and that you continue to have your hand on this nation, God. We humbly ask for your continued guidance and help, your hand, your blessing, your presence on us, God. You said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We call on your name, God. We call on your name. Ask that you would lead us and guide us in all that we do in our decisions. God, ask that your Holy Spirit, your presence would be with us and upon us, God that you would guide and direct our thoughts, our decisions, that you would grant us wisdom. God, we thank you. Just as King Solomon prayed long ago to be a good king for the good of the people, God, we pray now for our leaders here, God, that you would grant them wisdom, be with them for the good of the people. We ask your presence today in all decisions in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and welcome to the Pinal County Board of Supervisors. It happens to be February 23rd, 2022. And let's see, we will call this meeting to order. Item number one is call to the public. Uh, so anyone that would like to address the, pub, uh, the uh, Board of Supervisors need not request permission in advance. Action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter or rescheduling the matter for further consideration and decision at a later date. I presently have two requests. Uh, first one would be Mr. Wiesner, Mike Wiesner. There you are. If you could please, I just stated your name, but if you would please state your name and generally where you live, that would be great. Thank you. My name is Mike Wiesner. I live in Oracle. Uh, the southern part of the county, as you know, and I'm here to talk about that issue with the southern part of the county. Several years ago, I came before the board to ask for your support to help preserve Arizona's oldest natural resource, the night sky. And you did that. Oracle State Park became designated as the first international dark sky park in the Arizona State Park system. Today, I come before you to talk about an issue that's just as critical but it is way more complex than just doing something with outdoor lighting. Beginning in 2013, I started worrying about the impacts of a federal regulation called the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, Designated Market Area Regulation, DMA. That prohibited citizens in the southern half of the county from watching Tucson TV stations. All of Pinal County was put into the designated market area for Phoenix, which means that people who live in the southern part of the county cannot watch local news, local weather, local sports, local advertising, local emergency information from stations that are just 30 miles away from where they live. Instead, we get stations that are 120 miles away. As a result of my efforts that began in 2013, in 2015, the FCC contacted me and said they had just changed a policy that would allow local governments to submit a petition for market area modifications. I contacted Supervisor Rios and Supervisor Smith at that time to start working on this petition to the FCC, and they did. Unfortunately, that effort stalled in 2019 due to a staff change, and it kind of languished. However, in early 20, January of 2020, the effort was picked back up, and that continued, but then the COVID-19 pandemic hit us, proving that what I had been saying all along was true. This regulation by our federal government was putting local lives at risk because we did not know what was going on in the southern part of the county or down in Pima County from COVID. Did not know those impacts, how serious it was. Phoenix stations did a great job talking about what was going on in central Arizona, northern Arizona, but very little about what was coming in our area. In April of 2020, Congressman Tom O'Halloran's staff had a conference call. Supervisor Smith was on that call, several other members of the, the county staff, um, 
and myself and Congressman Halloran's staff. We had a great discussion. Everybody agreed that this legislation at that time and then the, the FCC DMA re regulation was putting lives at risk and it was harming local businesses who advertise on the Tucson stations. But nothing was done. And in fact, it was actually a damaging phone call because the congressman's staff recommended to the county to suspend its effort on that petition. Totally the wrong thing to tell the county to do because the petition has to come from the county. There are some members of Congress who think that using the Internet is a solution. Can you understand? Wrap up. Yeah, they think it's a solution. It is not. Citizens are already paying to get their local TV on DirecTV and Dish TV. We need to continue that. This is a complex issue. There's lots of money involved. The county needs to finish this work on a petition to the FCC and submit it urgently. Thank the you. next crisis is weeks, days, or hours away. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Lou, could you look into the progress on that? Yes, Nick, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wiesner. Uh, let's see. Mr. Reck. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm Noel Reck from Casa Grande. This statement has been very frustrating for me, as I've had to change it several times over the last few weeks due to the steady torrent of insanity pouring out of our state government. That said, today I would like to speak to several topics, some good, some bad, some ugly. The good, it's my understanding that the $100,000 reimbursement plan for the Sheriff's Department is not to be used for border deployment. I hope that will remain true. The ethically challenged Mark Brnovich has posited the ridiculous opinion that Governor Ducey can wage war on the border. That's unconstitutional and he knows it. Just more red meat for the base as he runs for higher office. Yet nothing surprises us. I saw the Sheriff's Department has recently interdicted a large supply of fentanyl. That's great. But let's use that to take a look, closer look at the problem. A month ago, I spoke here about push-pull factors that relate to the border issues. In relation to fentanyl, what are the push factors? Poverty, money, and power. The pull factors? American demand and addiction. The scourge of fentanyl will never end until the demand is far reduced or eliminated. Thus, I urge the board to explore ways to deal with the pull side of the issue with the same energy and monetary support it has provided to deal with the push side. $100,000 could go a long way to help desperate people before they hurt or kill themselves or others. The bad? the selection of Paul Gosar acolyte Teresa Martinez to the legislature. In short time, she has shown herself to be unresponsive to communications from her constituents, of which I am one, an extremist of the highest degree, and a proponent of the big lie and notable House Bills 2596 and 2033, among so many other pieces of ludicrous legislation. Her selection was a mistake, as was that of Neil Carter, who has followed that same path. Now bad turned ugly. House Bill 2596, along with voter suppression, would have allowed the legislator to nullify election results. Thank goodness Republican Speaker Bowers had the courage to shut it down. While not surprised, I was disgusted by the support of my supposed representatives, Fitch and Leach, and the aforementioned Martinez. I don't think the citizens of Pinal County would be in agreement with that type of power grab. Do you? Likewise, Fincham's House Bill 2033, which once again calls for decertifying Arizona's 2020 electoral votes. Will this insanity ever end? I'm told that if I mention you by name, you can respond. So this I now do, and I urge you to respond. I call upon you, Supervisor Surdy, Kavanaugh, Goodman, Miller, and McClure, like Republican Speaker Bowers, do you have the will to put forth a censure motion, an official rebuke, whatever you may have at your disposal, to let the public know you do not countenance this type of vile legislation? The names I know from Pinal County are Finch and Leach, Martinez, Carter, and Cook. If there are others, please include them as well. To go further, include all the names of those statewide that signed on to these shameful bills. Might I suggest the same in regard to the fake slate of electors. These anti-American, anti-democracy frauds and their actions need to be fully exposed, condemned, and prosecuted. Might you denounce the repulsive and despicable shootout ads from Big Jim whatever, featuring a cameo appearance from Sheriff Lamb? Silence regarding these actions is complicity. With all due respect, do you have the will? I'd like to leave a couple articles here regarding the fentanyl issue, if I might. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see. Next we have Mr. Smith, Brett Smith. If you please state your name and generally where you live, please. Uh, Brett Smith, Santan Valley. Okay, I feel a pleasure to address um, you today as I speak of one of the most pressing issues for our children in Santan Valley. <laughs> Chief Deputy Thomas of the Pinal County Sheriff's Department is the decision maker to place a full-time armed police resource officer on the Santan Foothills campus. Principal Miller has informed me that funding has been approved and a request submitted to the Sheriff's Department. Chief Deputy Thomas is in doubt that funding has been approved. I have called Dr. Lecky, the assistant superintendent for the Florence Unified School District, as I am told he is responsible to coordinate with Chief Deputy Thomas to make this resource officer placement. Dr. Lecky has told me that Chief Deputy Thomas is holding this up. The police Chief Deputy Thomas says that it is being held up by the Board of Supervisors. The urgency to place a resource officer at Santan Foothills cannot be expressed enough. I have spoken with other parents who agree this is one of the most pressing issues for our students, which represents the second highest concentration of people in Santan Valley behind Post and Butte High School, which already has a resource officer on campus. I researched the discipline data that is made public on each school's board report for Florence Unified School District. Santan Valley, Santan Foothills has the highest number of fights per student in Florence Unified School District. Even if you take out um, a record number of seven fights in, in one particular month last year, they are still the highest. Santan Foothills also has drugs on campus which are offered and solicited by students. My brother is a teacher in another state and they have a resource officer in school. My brother commented on how teachers and school staff are not as well trained or equipped to address criminal activities which can occur in a school. He has said his school has benefited greatly from having a resource officer for the past 10 years. There is a trend around the nation to place police officers on school grounds. A good officer is a great thing for students. Nationally, students have felt safer even going to the officer more often than reporting to the school employees. A great resource officer can handle any kind of weapon, bullying, sexual harassment, or assault and provide the students with a positive interaction. <laughs> I've been told that this may be a lack of officers available for the, for the position. How can the sheriff's office stand idly by as students are feeling unsafe at this public campus? Where else is more important than Santan Foothills High School where a resource officer can influence the lives of 900 plus people on a daily basis in one place? I know that other schools in the Florence Unified School District already have resource officers on campus. It is a concern about the response. There's also co a concern about the response time for first responders due to location being away from major streets for this high school. Having an officer on campus full time would alleviate these concerns for the school and administrators and parents. The impactful influence of one resource officer can be monumental in the lives of the next generation of adults in our community. <laughs> there needs to be urgency on both sides to place a resource officer at Santan Foothills immediately. Chief Deputy Salmas says, first we need to go to the Board of Supervisors to obtain permission to accept the funding and backfill the position. Then we can move forward. I strongly urge and request that Supervisor Goodman and Chief Deputy Thomas make this their top priority and have a resource officer placed at the school within the next two months. No time should be lost to effectively allocate police officers than by placing one at the highest concentration of people in Santan Valley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Supervisor Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is something, and maybe directed to staff, we, we, we did approve some of these items, and I'm just curious, can you get back with us and let's meet with um, Matt and... and see where we're at on that because it's been my understanding that we approved this as a board to uh, fund some of that. We, there was some resources that we had available to us financial. Is that right, Leo? Uh, uh, yes, Supervisor Goodman. We have approved some of these in the past. I don't know specifically if we've uh, approved this one for the Santan Foothills. So we'll get with Chief Thomas and, and work on this. Okay. And, and along with that, 
and I've said this a lot, is the fact that I've got five high schools in my district alone, five. And it, it, to, to the fact that, you know, preventative is one of the big measures and having a resource officer available, especially on the high school level, is very important. So could you see where we're at on that and what we can do? And let's get with the sheriff's department and work through that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else wish to address the board? Good morning. If you could please Good state morning. your name and generally where you live, please. Mr. Chair, um, Vice Chair and members of the board, I'm Richard Myers from Coolidge. My son asked me to be here. He couldn't be here this morning. Last meeting, he argued that Satanism is not pitchforks and s s red suits, but it is acting according to our own wisdom in contradiction to God's word. This is in regard to the invocation. Is an invocation worthwhile? not as an empty ritual. God is not flattered nor misled. Not as an occasion for self-congratulation. God is not impressed. Whether or not an invocation is worthwhile depends on our humility. It is worthwhile to humbly appeal to the living God. Consider the frustration of advising a young person who thinks your advice is worthless. Remember your sinking heart, your sorrow for them. Good men are pleased to be trusted, and God is pleased when we trust him. God expresses his pleasure in the humble, promising in James chapter 1, quote, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him, unquote. Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the board by publicly seeking God's wisdom you may set a conspicuous example this example is potentially the most valuable contribution you can make to the narrative of history the invocation affords one such opportunity Mr. McCrow. Thank you. Mr. Myers. Any others care to address the board? Mr. Ravellis, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Roberto Ravellis. Approaching age 90, I'm finding it more difficult to read my text, hence my f for the first time I've attempted to raise a podium. Mr. Chairman, what's going on with Arizona's formerly grand old party? I think it's time for genuine friends to organize a crisis intervention. Some examples follow. Perpetuating the big lie that Donald Trump won Arizona's presidential, presidential election by submitting fake electoral college documents, declaring the traitorous January 6th insurrection as, quote, legitimate political discourse, unquote, sort of like calling the crucifixion of Jesus as a therapeutic 
body stretching procedure. Enacting extremist voter suppression laws that will reduce participation in Arizona's voting by all political parties. Unanimous Republican voting against American Rescue Plan funds designed to help America's and Arizona's consumers, businesses, and government at all levels to recover from the disastrous economic losses caused by the pandemic. Then distributing those funds without noting that it was only because of the Democratic Party alone voting to appropriate these funds. Mr. Chairman, confusion and questions continue in today's agenda. Seeking taxpayer funds to reduce impaired driving behaviors, funding county narcotics task force and border drug interdiction, while the sheriff seeking those funds heads a household, and I regret having to say this, that includes an illegal drug-using driver who avoided a bench arrest warrant for failure to appear, but who was eventually convicted. Seeking coronavirus emergency funding by the sheriff, who publicly and cynically proclaims he will not enforce public health protective policies within his own department's personnel, as they intermingle with those of us from the general public who are vulnerable. Seeking approval of 14 consent agenda items totaling today alone over $1 million in taxpayer funds for a sheriff whose far-ranging financial transactions raise realistic concerns of intermingled public funds with political groups. The same sheriff whose activities have been under investigation by Arizona's attorney general, according to that agency's own public announcement. Seeking federal funding for semiconductor manufacturing by Arizona's congressional delegation without asking Arizona's Republican members of Congress to reconsider, please, their opposition to the legislation that created this funding. Many confusing questions, but little opportunity thus far, Mr. Chairman, for taxpayers seeking accountability. Mr. Chairman, it's embarrassingly time for this board to demand accountability by our Republican office holders. Finally, I remind you of the pending public request to schedule confidence-building county department accountability sessions with our taxpayers. This was a request made in anticipation of learning how much our county is spending on unaudited projects, including those listed above, and the as yet unreported county expenses for the former president's political rally in Pinal County. Members of the board, I support your efforts to seek financial help for our county, but please demand explanations from those office holders whose actions raise doubts about these vital programs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ravello, for your comments. Are there any others that would care to address the board? Seeing none, we'll move on to item two, presentation of certificates of service to employees for 20 and 25 years. Mr. Liu. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Today we have seven employees to celebrate uh, that have been here for 20 and 25 years. Only two of them are present uh, this morning, so I'll go ahead and read the other five uh, to honor them. First is Linda Martinez from the Pinal County Sheriff's Office. She's been here for 20 years and uh, leads uh, the grants there as the grant, grant administrator. Um, she has processed and reconciled I'm sure more grants than, uh, than any of us would, would be able to count. I worked long and hard on those, and I've personally worked with her um, on some of those, and I know she does a really good job and very dedicated. So thank you, Linda. And we have uh, David Haley as well from Pinal County Sheriff's Office, um, who has been here for 20 years as a deputy sheriff. And then we have Joseph 
and forgive me if I mispronounce the last name, Joseph Rothel, um, hired as a corporal originally 20 years ago and is a deputy sheriff today. And then from the Copper Quarter Justice Court, we have uh, Carolina Estrada, um, who has been here 20 years and is a justice court clerk. Uh, for 25 years, we have um, our chief information officer, Steve Frazier. He was hired back in 97 as a drafting specialist, so he worked in the assessor's office for, for many years um, and promoted his way up through. So congratulations and thank you to Steve. And then for the two that are here um, from Pinal County Sheriff's Office, we have Michael um, Huey, I believe or hope that's a correct pronunciation. And is Michael here this morning? Thanks, sir. I don't know if uh, you or Chief Thomas wanted to come up and, and say a few words. So I'd just like to thank Mike because I've known him, well, since he was in the academy, yeah. Um, he's a great detective. He's in our detective division right now and a uh, great detective. Little known fact, he is one of the top whitetail hunters in our agency and we have a lot of them. He is uh, one heck of a hunter. He, he hunts and lives down in the uh, Copper Corridor area and just been a great cop his whole career and so I just congratulate him. Appreciate that. Yep. Thank you, Mike and Chief Thomas. Appreciate you being here to celebrate and to have us honor you here in person. Um, and then we have Mary Dreyer, who has been with the county for 25 years in public defense services um, as a public defender attorney. Is Mary here this morning with us? Hi, Mary. And is uh, Kate or Kathy here? Did you want to come up and see if you were? Oh, Jamie is. Okay. Hey, Jamie. An attorney that doesn't want to talk? Nick Whaley, what's up? <laughs> We're not on billable time, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> Chairman, Vice Chairman, Supervisors, um, Mary's been with the Public Defender's Office um, probably a little bit longer than 25 years because she started off as a law clerk and came back, and she's provided great service. She's uh, pretty much handled almost every assignment our office has ever had, from misdemeanors to felonies. Uh, we're glad to have her. She still does great work, and uh, um, thank you for honoring her today. Congratulations. Uh, can, can we get a Thank you. If, yeah, if Mary and Mike want to come up and take a photograph with the board. Mary, Mary, don't go away. Um, come, come right up front. <laughs> right up front. We'll get pictures. Oh, he is? Okay. Kevin's here someplace. Okay. Um, oh, oh, Mr. Chairman, Yo. I think we do have one more. I think uh, Joseph uh, Rothley is here from PCSO, and I didn't have Mark down on the list. So, um, Joseph, if, are you here? Come on down. Did you want to come up and say anything or have anybody say something about you?
Casey. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, item number three, Mr. Liu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of items I wanted to mention to, to you and the public this morning. First, I wanted to congratulate um, this board, um, the county, and the city of Casa Grande on the announcement for um, Kohler's investment at a site in Casa Grande. Some of you probably seen uh, the articles, but they're building a one million square foot production and distribution facility for um, their high growth line of uh, Vicryl bath and shower fixtures. And we expect to see um, 400 full-time jobs directly at that facility. And uh, I know the board has for many years um, had a strategic priority around bringing primary jobs and increasing uh, the skill and the workforce in our county. And so this, of course, will uh, result in um, other indirect and induced economic activity. So um, congratulations. And I wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, some of us that are involved uh, public health, thank you to Andy Smith and Joe Ortiz and Chris Wanamaker uh, because they're coordinating with the city to make sure all the infrastructure needs and road needs are, are available and will be there timely for the facility to be operational in August of 23. And then also uh, thank you to uh, Mike Sunbloom and Anu Jane who uh, make sure that all the air quality permitting needs are being met for this company. And then thank you also to Joel Millman and James Smith who are working to ensure their workforce uh, development needs and recruiting and um, are met. So thank, thank you to the whole team. It takes a team effort, and thank you to the city of Casa Grande as well. Thank you, Mr. Liu. And then one, one other announcement just to, for the public and all of you to be aware, uh, <laughs> the Lost Dutchman Days uh, is here, and it's running pretty much from the 24th through the 26th. And if you want to just Google Lost Dutchman Days, you can see, but there's plenty of going on. It's a big event. There's rodeo events, uh, carnivals, parades, um, eating and drinking, dancing, um, all types of uh, great entertainment, bull riding and wrestling steers. I think Supervisor Sturdy might be out there wrestling one down. We can take a look at that. Um, so, yeah, Google it and check it out and uh, have a good time. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's see. Item number four, purchasing division report. Ms. Peterson, are you, there you are. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, and members of the board. I am Tiara Peterson, Purchasing Manager for Pinal County, and this is your purchasing report for February 23rd, 2022. First, the board is requested to approve the following contract amendments. RFP 19052 for in-home detention and alcohol monitoring. We recommend approval of amendment number two to extend the term of the contract effective February 12th, 2022 through February 11th, 2023 with GPS monitoring of Arizona LLC and SCRAM of Arizona Inc. This contract is used by the Justice Courts and Adult Probation. RFP 20205 for Workforce Development Data Analyst. We recommend approval of a change in the scope of work to the contract with Partnership for Workforce Innovation. The current term of this contract will expire on September 29th, 2022. Uh, this contract is used by Economic and Workforce Development Department. Uh, lastly, the board is requested to approve the following purchase request per Pinal County Procurement Code, Section PC1-350 governing competition impracticable purchases over $100,000. For a purchase in the amount of $10 million with Zao for a fiber project for increased broadband internet services. This contract will be used countywide. And that concludes your purchasing division report for February 23rd, 2022. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I'll ask for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh Approve the purchasing uh, report for February 23rd, 2022, as presented. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you very much, Ms. Peterson. Have a great day. And item number five, consent items. All items indicated by an asterisk will be handled by a single vote as part of the consent agenda unless a board member, county manager, or member of the public objects at the time the agenda item is called. Uh, presently, I have item BD being pulled by Mr. Zweig. Is there a, any others that need to be pulled? 
Mr. Chair, for clarification, items A, oh, I'm, if I could, A, A um, is that AI and AJ? A, what? AI and AJ. You want to pull those? Yeah, j just from staff, I just have some questions about it. A AI and AJ? Yeah. Okay. So we have items A, I, and A, J pulled by Supervisor Goodman. Any others? Seeing none. Um, can I get a motion to approve item A through B, E minus items A, I, A, J, and B, D? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve items A through um, B, E minus a I A J and B D. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Hearing no, none of well, any opposed? No, you're not hearing any. Motion is approved. Uh, let's see, let's start with A I. Supervisor Goodman. Uh, yes, and, and is Steve, are you gonna be the one to come up and approach? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um and I know, you know, sometimes we get these consent items and there's so, there's so much there. Can you help me, what is it that we're amending here on these two particular ordinances? Sure, so the Exhibit A of these two zoning cases that were done a couple years ago, there was a missing line of text on Exhibit A to fully legally describe the boundaries of the zoning case. Okay. Yep. So it's, a, it's really a technical issue. In your packets, we showed that the uh, notices were all done according to plan and the uh, acreages line up from when it got noticed to PNZ to the board. And then AJ, if I could go to that one too as well. You may. Okay. Is it the same way there then? Exactly the same okay. thing, yeah. I just needed clarification for myself sure. so that I'm not making a mistake up here whenever I vote to approve it or disapprove it. Understandable. Okay, thanks. All right. <clears throat> so, so we, let's, can we move both those? So, so I, go ahead. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve AI and AJ as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Um, move on. Let's see. A, AI and AJ are approved. Uh, motion, or uh, I'm sorry, item BD, Mr. Zweig. Good morning. I'm Todd Zweig. I'm the Superior Court Administrator. <clears throat> this item, and before we begin, I'd like to provide a correction. first item submitted indicated it was the Arizona Revised Statute, which allows this to happen, and the actual attachment was not that, so I've provided a copy for, for each one of you. This is a request. Um, the presiding judge has established what's called a, a probate fund, and a probate fund can be used for several different things, but in cases where there's a conservatorship, um, there's a... We're, we are going to charge an additional $150, a one-time fee, that's going to grow, go into what's called a probate fund, which is going to be used for accounting services. So in most um, guardianships and conservatorships, they're relatively straightforward, and it's, it might be a small, maybe a Social Security disability or something like that, where there's a small amount of money coming in, a small amount of money coming out, and when the annual accounting report is filed, it's very easy to understand and and to approve, but the, we do have some cases that are sufficiently complex, either because the the information submitted is is not complete, or um, there's a, enough money where it's very difficult to track where it's all going. And our responsibility is to ensure that um, money being um, monitored and taken care of by a conservator is being handled appropriately. So what we're asking for. Um, is for you to establish this probate fund, and it's a one-time fee when there's a conservatorship, um, when somebody applies for a conservatorship. It's a one-time fee. Um, it goes into a probate accounting fund, and when it, we need to use an accountant, the money will be there instead of coming to the board and asking for funds to do it here. 
Counties do it differently. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yavapai County does it where it's based on the amount of money in the estate, and every time an accounting report is filed, the fee is, the fee is charged. This is a one-time fee. The judge has the ability to waive it um, for good cause. Uh, uh, is there any questions that I can answer about, about it? Mr. Zweig, I have a quick question. How, how many of these in a year, say, occur? <coughs> well, from our numbers, we currently have 1,140 guardianship conservatorships, and I would say out of those, there's maybe 350 to 400 a year, but that number includes guardianships and conservatorships. They're not all conservatorships. I can't give you an exact number because the case management database that the clerk uses doesn't separate a, gar separate a guardianship from a conservatorship. It's one number. But it's not a huge number. It's not a huge number. Well, it's not a huge number, but it's a lot of money if you're having to do accounting. It's, it, can, it can be. So up until this point, we've used the resources we have. We struggle through it, but we understand that we don't want to miss anything. The last thing we want is someone be, maybe becoming 18 years old, and they've had a trust or an estate, and they get to, they get to be 18 years old, and, and the money's not there. So we want to ensure that the money is being um, handled correctly. So it can be a lot of money. Um, we don't know for sure because it's, it's something we haven't done yet. Supervisor Miller. Or. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, because my, my guess, my question would be in a similar line. I guess, what do you project the, the revenue will be generated in a year's time on, on this? Because, and then the, the one-time fee is applied when somebody uh, goes through probate court or decides to go, right. I mean, so just, when, I'm just trying to figure out when and then about what you think you'll collect in a year. Mr. Chair, Supervisor Miller, that's a great question. You, you always have those great questions. I, I understand that, and I wish I had an exact number for you. But So we had 30 new filings last month. Okay. Um, it would be assessed on every, anybody who is, uh, who is filing for a conservatorship. I can't give you the, the exact number. Um, I'd be able to come back after a year and, and give you a better idea, but since we haven't tracked it like this, I, I can't tell for sure. Okay. All right. Well, that's good for now. Any other questions? Mr. Supervisor Cavanaugh. So the other supervisors, thank you, have touched on a couple of my questions. And so last month we had 30 conservatorship filings. Is that, is that what you said a minute ago? We had 30 filings, but they were guardianships and or conservatorships. And because the case management database doesn't separate them out, it just tells me how many guardianship conservatorships we have. So going forward, we'll be able to track that better. Okay. And other counties, how do other counties in Arizona handle this? Are, do they impose the tax or? Some, some do, some don't. Um, Yavapai County... They do it based on the size of the estate, but it's a, yearly, it's a yearly fee. So every time an accounting report is filed, they charge the estate a certain amount based on the amount that is in the estate. It can be waived by the judge for good cause. Maricopa County charges, I believe, $300. Um, Pima County doesn't charge quite as much, but one of the problems is some, sometimes they include in their initial filing fee money that goes toward the probate fund, and it's all mixed together. Some counties separate it out. Some counties don't charge for it at all. Okay, and who does the audit when it occurs of the, of the conservatorship? Well, the vulnerable persons unit generally looks at the files and does the audit. The judge might take a look and do the audit, but these are, and, and that, ha that works a good amount of the time, but sometimes the case is very convoluted or, or the accounting reports that have been submitted um, aren't, are, are complex enough to where we need somebody to actually audit the case. And would that be in a CPA? That might be a CPA. Um, it, we're, we're, after today, if this goes through, we're going to compile a list of people that are qualified to do this, and we're going to have a list, and the court can use those for appointments. Has there been instances in the past where errors have occurred in, in large conservatorships, and what kind of problem does that cause? 
So I don't know of um, an error happening here that I know of. However, back probably around 2009, 2010 in Maricopa County, um, there several errors came to light based on some news articles and other things. And um, we've been trying to get this together and, and moving toward um, professionalizing how we do this um, since that time. Any other questions? I, I see Supervisor Goodman's brain bubbling a bit. So I, I just, I'm just curious as to why all these years we haven't done anything, and now you're coming forward right now to charge this, and I, you know, this fee tax, whatever you want to call it. I'm just curious as to what's the justification behind it. So probably, I think, a year, maybe a year and a half ago, we established what's called the Vulnerable Persons Unit. And that's a unit that takes care of people that are vulnerable populations. It could have mental health problems, um, guardianship, conservatorships, those different types of things. And we have staff now that are monitoring these cases after they're um, even a after there's a conservatorship or guardianship established. And as they've monitored the cases, we've come across more, uh, more times when we think, you know what, we think we know what's on, we think we understand this, we think we have it, but we really need an accountant or someone with that background to look at it. And so that's what the, that's what's going to be generated is to pay for that accountant? Yes. Is that my understanding? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Supervisor Miller. Just, just so I have it all straight in my mind here, which I, I kind of I understand this probably is not a bad way to approach it. You know, if, there's a, if there is a case that needs, that's, that is confusing or needs to be looked at from a professional, it's nice to have some funds to be able to, to provide that for both sides and for everybody. And, and so I, I, I think that's a great idea. I guess the second part of that is, uh, I don't know who you would work with to come up with a probably more or less what we'd call an on-call list of C CPAs that you could contact on a case-by-case -case basis. Is that kind of what I'm seeing? Yes, that's, that's what we're going to do. And it's much like we do for a court investigator or um, sure. different types of people that the court needs to appoint. We come up with a list that meet the qualifications. Meet the, meet the qualifications that you've set forth for this type of work. Correct. And then you can uh, call them. Well, you know, um, it's better than dipping into other funds. And I, if we can, if we can provide a, a, a pool of money that's available for these kind of cases as they come down, I don't think it's a bad idea. What I would suggest is, in a year from now, that you come back and really kind of tell us what, uh, how much revenue was generated, how many cases were, you know it was used on or needed, and have a better look at it at that point. How much was spent, right? And how much was spent, yeah. That, that's my suggestion, but anyway. It's a great suggestion. Oh, yep. Supervisor Kavanaugh. So could the court direct funds uh, from a large conservatorship to pay for the entirety of the cost of the audit associated with that one conservatorship? Yes, and I believe that's in the administrative order. It gives the judge the, um, the option in certain cases uh, if – if the fee is very high or it takes a, a, lot of, a lot of time and it's based on the fact that what was submitted wasn't correct or it was so convoluted it couldn't be understood, the judge can order um, direct, a direct compensation from the estate. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so why would we want to fee or tax the smaller conservatorships, the smaller estates, when it's the large estate who ha has the problem. If, it's con if they brought you a convoluted case, why wouldn't the judge say, you know, this is a large estate, we're going to um, take a two or $3,000 and hire an accountant to audit this? Mr. Chair, uh, Supervisor Kavanaugh, that's a, that's a good point. Um, the, larger, the, the cases that have the large amount of funds in them are the, usually the most difficult, but the smaller ones often need some type of accounting work and some to be checked on, and the bank needs to be contacted and, and different kind of things. So different ones require different things, but the more complex cases usually cost more. Any other questions? I, I, I guess, the, if I might... You, you may. Okay, thank you. So what have we been doing so far? 
What have we been doing so far as a, for accounting services? Yeah, even on the, on the, on the lesser ones. What, what's been our process all along? Our case managers now handle the lesser ones if they can. So we have case managers to handle this. Prior to probably a year and a half ago, the judge managed all these cases himself or herself. Now we have case managers doing it. But there are some that they're probably not qualified to do, and we need an independent person to come in and do it. Okay. And I'll ask again. Any more questions? <laughs> We're just being thorough. Yeah, you are. Uh, I appreciate that. All right. Not seeing any other questions arise, then uh, do I have a motion for BD? Mr. Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to uh, approve item BD as presented. I would add, may, and may I? Second. Okay. And I would just like to add that we bring this back in a year for a report. Yes. So that, you want that in the motion? Yes. I'm and looking also, at you. <laughs> yes. that, that'll, get, that'll get it on the calendar. You know. Yes, and also if we can include the correction to the ARS statute. And the correction to the ARS statute along with a, a, a one-year review. Does that work? Okay. So I have a motion. I do I still have a second? I still have a second. Okay. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Thank Zweig. Appreciate it. Thank you, Todd. Oh, let's see. This time I will recess the Board of Supervisors regular meeting and open the Desert Vista Sanitary District Board of Directors meeting. So there are two items on this meeting, and all items indicated by an asterisk will be handled by a single vote as part of the consent agenda unless a board member, county manager, or member of the public objects at the time the agenda is called, or the agenda item is called. Are there any items that anyone cares to pull? Seeing none, uh, I would ask for a motion here on items A and B. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. I make a motion to uh, approve consent items A and B on the Desert Vista Sanitary District Board of Directors meeting. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motions pass. And at this time, I will adjourn the Desert Vista Sanitary District Board meeting of directors like that. And I will open the Flood Control District Board of Directors meeting thusly. And this has four items, and all items indicated by an asterisk will be handled by a single vote as part of the consent agenda, unless a board member, county manager, or member of the public objects at the time the agenda item is called. Does anyone care to pull an item on this list? Seeing none, I'd ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chair, I make a motion to approve consent items A through D on the Pinal County Flood Control District Board of Directors meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Hearing none, motions pass. We will now adjourn the Flood Control District Board of Directors meeting and reconvene the Board of Supervisors regular meeting. And we'll move on to item eight. And reading my mind, Ms. Garza. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman McClure, Vice Chair Surdy, members of the board. I am Celeste Garza with Public Works. I'll be your presenter for items 8, 9, 10, and 11 today. Um, item 8, these are all extinguishments or abandonments located in District 5 in Apache Junction. Very small pieces. Um, all of these are which uh, property owners would like to develop in their lots, but their lots are very small, so they're trying to get rid of some of these easements that we don't currently maintain a road on. Um, no legal access has been compromised in any of these. Um, all utilities are in agreement, and the petitioner has obtained uh, signatures from all the surrounding property owners, as well as we notify within 300 feet. So this is a piece of Colt Road. Uh, this is a photo looking south down the alignment. And this is looking from the Tonto alignment, looking, from, uh, looking along the Tonto alignment from Winchester. Happy to answer any questions. 
Are there any, oh, are there any questions? All right. We're having equipment malfunctions up here. Uh, so I would open the public hearing at this time. This is, has that aspect. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number eight as presented. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second second. <laughs> so I would, I would call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Moving right along. Oh, Ms. Garza, <laughs> you're back. <laughs> uh, item 10 is a small piece of Labarge Road. Nine. Go to nine. Oh, nine. See, See you're just uh, jumping ahead. Don't, no. don't read ahead so far. <laughs> <laughs> item nine is a small piece of Labarge between Bell Street and Rebus, um, also lo located in Apache Junction. Um, this gentleman, Mr. Roberts, would like to place a septic system for a new home. Um, again, same routine, checked all the boxes for a favorable recommendation by staff. So no legal access is compromised, petitioners um, 100%, and utilities are in agreement. This is a photo looking south down the little barge alignment. And this is looking east towards the superstitions and looking west. Any questions? Nice view. <laughs> uh, I, any, any questions? All right. Uh, this has this also has a public hearing, so I would open the public hearing. Anyone care to speak to this item? Item nine. Seeing none, we will close the public hearing, and I would ask for a motion on item nine. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number nine as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Hearing none, item number nine passes. And for a third time, Ms. Garza, number 10. Item 10. Uh, this is a piece of Whiteley Street uh, between Gold Drive and Valley View. Um, again, the property owner would like to place a fence and use the property for recreation. Um, here's, here's what it looks like. That we do not maintain a roadway along this alignment again. Um, full signatures, everyone was in, in agreement. So this is looking east from gold. As you can see, it hasn't uh, been used for any type of access at this time. And this is looking west from the Valley View alignment. All right, any questions? All right, seeing none. This item, this item also has a public hearing. So I will open the public hearing on item 10. Anyone care to speak to this? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and I would ask for a motion. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we approve item number 10 as presented. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Let's see what surprises we have. Number 11, <laughs> look at you. And finally, Mr. Chairman, we have item 11, which is a small piece of Plaza Drive um, from Frontier Street South, 300 feet. Um, uh, again, the property owner would like to build a new home on his lot. And there's the piece. Um, again, no legal access issues or petitioner um, surrounding property owners. Everyone was in agreement. Look, this is looking south from Frontier Street and looking north from Kanixu. I couldn't get to the point of the beginning because it hasn't been used. Any questions? Any questions? Seeing and hearing none, this item also has a public hearing. We'll open the public hearing. Anyone care to speak to this item? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. I'd ask for a motion. Mr. Chair, I'm Make a motion that we approve item number 11 as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Garza. That was lovely. Item number 12.
We have water franchise agreement between Pinal County and Tonto Basin Water Company. Mr. Johnson. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, item number 12 today is a franchise water agreement for the Tonto Basin Water Company. Alex Wagner from Tonto Basin Water Company, I believe, is going to be joining us on the phone if there are any questions. Pursuant to ARS 4283, uh, the county can regulate um, public utilities and our rights of way through franchise agreements. Uh, Tonto Basin has uh, duly applied for and we recommend, as does Public Works, um, approval of this franchise agreement to provide water services to Pinal County. All right. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Anyone have any questions? Well, these are easy. Wow. Okay. So this item has a public hearing. We'll open the public hearing. Anyone care to speak to this item? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and I'd ask for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve item number 12 uh, as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. I should have you stay and not, you know, just because we got a few more to go, just like Celeste, you know. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, item 13. We have, a, we have Mr. Ortiz, public hearing on the right-of-way easement for Sunzia. Trying to share the wealth. We don't want Celeste to hog up the show. So, uh, Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, Board of Supervisors, Joe Ortiz, Pinal County Public Works Deputy Director. Uh, item 13 is a follow-up to a work session that we had on February 9th uh, in reference to Sunzia transmission line. Um, Specifically, today we're asking to take action on the right of way easement agreement. Um, this right of way agreement is specifically for the leg of Early Road right of way. On the easterly side, we have uh, Picacho Reservoir, and it terminates right near 11 Mile Corner. Um, we do have representatives from Sunzia here uh, available if, if you have any specific questions for them. Um, but staff does recommend approval of this agreement. All right. Is there any questions? Mr. Cavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The only thing I mentioned at the, I believe, the work session was that the language is included that the, the contract be governed by the laws of the state of Arizona. Was that added? Correct. That was added. Any other questions? You're asking questions? No, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I did want to provide some clarification for the board. In order for this item to be approved, it requires unanimous consent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This item also has a public hearing piece to it. I will open the public hearing for item 13. Is there anyone who cares to speak to this item? <coughs> Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. And I would ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chair, I... Make a, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number 13 as presented. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, item 13 passes. Moving right along, we have item 14, sale of an animal control truck to the Huachuca City Police Department. Uh, this looks like... Audra Michael, it looks just like you. Thank you, Chairman, Vice Chair, members of the board. Um, the Huachuca City Animal Control reached out to us asking if we would be willing to sell the, our, one of our ACO trucks to them for between a dollar and ten dollars. And this particular truck was used back when I first started as an officer 11 years ago, and we haven't used it in about seven years. It has a high amount of miles on it, and um, considering their truck is 35 years old, I think that it would be fair to help them out, and I'm always willing to help out fellow agencies in Arizona, so I would like to help them by selling this truck to them. Okay. Are there any questions? I uh, I want to. I have several questions, not necessarily so much for Audra, but for Leo, et cetera. This happens quite a lot in uh, local government, and 
the citizens see this and they say, wow, it's a sweetheart deal. Why not sell this at auction and put it into the general fund or the fund of the department? Uh, truck market is hot right now. I mean, you can't hardly find used trucks. So what are what is our reasoning for just basically giving it away rather than trying to recoup something? And because this is this is not the only time this will come up. This comes up quite often. And uh, what are the expenses in running it through an auction? And uh, also, Wachuca is not in Pinal County. Wouldn't we rather see it go maybe to a Pinal County uh, community? So several questions there, if we could answer. Yes, uh, thank you, Supervisor Surdy. And um, I'll be able to, I don't have them on hand, all of the details of this particular truck and the transaction, but um, generally speaking, we will evaluate, you know, the value that it brings to the county, what, how much it would cost to maintain it going forward, continue to use it for purposes that would fit our functions. Um, to the point of your questions, how much and what would be the expense on uh, taking this on the online auction and what would we get for it versus the value um, giving to another uh, jurisdiction for their function and their use. Um, I don't know the specifics on this particular one, but I'll be able to um, to get back to you on it. And I don't see the person who probably would have that present here. So um, I could look into the specific one, unless, Audrey, you happen to know um, from that perspective? Um, what I do know is it has about 205,000 miles on it, and we have it's been redlined for years, and we haven't used it. And we also have others that are going to go to auction as well. So, so it's just sitting? Mm -hmm. It's been sitting at fleet for years. Okay. Yeah. So that, like I said, the, the residents want to know, know this side. This, uh, so the fleet is managed by Public Works? Uh, uh, we have a fleet director that, that manages yeah. the fleet department. And for it's in that department? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, they do stuff for public works, but ev everywhere else in the county, too, PCSO, animal care and control, right. all the other vehicles, centralized. So, for instance, let's say this thing brings $5,000 at an auction, but we anticipate it costing two or $3,000 a year to keep it on the road. In a couple years, we've lost money instead of right. recouping something. Right, or storage or otherwise, yeah. Vice Chairman Surdy, as to your question about helping out other agencies within Pinal County, we are talking to the city of Coolidge because their truck is also very old, and we are speaking to them and possibly loaning them one of our trucks that we have that might help them out as well. But this particular truck, we just we haven't used it in years and years, so it's just basically sitting. And um, we used to use the swab boxes off of the back of the trucks and sell the truck itself and reuse the swab boxes, which we can no longer do because of the Freon and the way that the air conditioning is set up now. So it's completely of no use to us. Okay. All right, I appreciate the clarification and probably expect the same questions whenever this, these items come up for donation or auction. So, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Supervisor. We'll make sure when we have the next one on the agenda, we can give you a good, thorough explanation on the, the decision-making process on the cost-benefit. Thanks again. Thank you, Ms. Michaels. Okay. Uh, with that, I would ask for a motion, or unless anyone else has a question. You, Mr. Cavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the director said this is a 35-year-old truck, and it says 2005. Are we confident no, that we have? She what doesn't she do math. She's not a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> Works with animals. No, Pretty I'm deep. sorry, Su Supervisor Cavanaugh. Their truck is 35 oh, years oh, old. Okay, Ours good. is not. <laughs> ah. I can add. <laughs> Thank that's, you. that's how she said it too. So, okay, Supervisor. I, I just have a question with Leo to Leo. Is there a way that you can put some kind of uh, uh, appraisal on those when they do come before us? Yep. What we think the value is? Yep. Okay. Can do. Mr. Chairman? M Mr. Keller. Also, uh, according to uh, statute, to, to transfer this to another governmental entity, it requires unanimous consent. Yes. Thank you. All right. So we have all the clarifications, I believe. And is there a motion? Or may Mr. Chairman, I have a motion? I move that we approve item 14 as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. We have followed statute. All right. Item number 15. I believe this is Ms. Shepard. Good morning.
Chairman McClure, Vice Chairman Surdy, members of the board, Mary Ellen Shepard, Deputy County Manager. We are requesting your approval today to create four new classifications. A review of our existing classifications showed nothing existed in the current inventory to meet the needs of our departments. And so the four new classifications are a veterinarian assistant. This will be used in animal care and control. Animal care and control has a veterinarian that comes in on a weekly basis and others assist as available. We need a dedicated resource to assist these veterinarians in prep, procedures, and follow-up care. These duties are currently being performed by the deputy director, often in an after-hour capacity. This will have no budget impact. The second position is a guardian investigator. Intake and investigations are required of the public fiduciary to determine the appropriateness of guardianship and availability of assets. What in past years was a part-time role now takes full-time dedicated attention. And in lieu of using the guardian administrator, which is a very difficult to fill position, we are seeking to create a guardian investigator. This will open up the applicant pool to those having experience in investigation and working with vulnerable populations versus the administrator, which requires state certification and again is a very limited pool. This also will have no budget impact. The next classification we are seeking is to create an HR deputy director. Challenges with respect to recruitment and retention of a qualified workforce are being faced in every department and elected office in the county. The need exists for revision of our practices, our policies, and our rules. These changes are considered essential in today's work environment. To meet the current and future needs, we're asking for the creation of the deputy director, which would predominantly focus on day-to-day -day operations, freeing up the director for the oversight responsibilities, as well as addressing these countywide initiatives, a revision and a, or at least a look at compensation policies and practices, merit rules, as well as other strategic focus. This change will also have no budget impact on the department. The final position classification we're asking permission to create is a clinical liaison. The county has convened a stakeholder group to address restoration to competency. Among the representatives on this committee are the court, the county attorney, the Office of Public Defense Service, Public Defender, the Sheriff's Office, County Manager. This group is convened to look at developing this program. One of the initial and primary decisions and requirements is the creation of the clinical liaison. ARS 1345-13 requires the court to appoint a clinical liaison to manage continuity of care for anyone placed in this restoration treatment program. Currently, the county does not have such a position. This one, if approved and the position created, will require budget allocation uh, in the amount of 65242 annually and 17565 for this year. Any questions about any of these four classifications or seeking your permission to create? I see Supervisor Goodman's hand going up. Supervisor, Chairman McClure, Supervisor Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Per, good peripheral. Okay, okay. 
Uh, you know, Mary Ellen, the, the last one here, the clinical liaison, did I hear you clearly that it's required that they, that the court appoint somebody to be the liaison? What are we doing right now? Are we hiring that out? Um, to, you know what? I am not going to make up an answer here. So in other I words, actually, you don't know. <laughs> well, oh, it's on. my understanding the duties aren't being performed. Oh. But before I leave this podium with an answer I'm not 100% confident about, I've asked Natalie Jones to join me today, and she has far greater expertise in this particular area. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Ms. Jones. Good, good morning. Afternoon. Good morning, uh, still, actually. She is correct. Uh, that currently uh, these duties are not being performed and it is a statutorily required position and that does not exist currently. We have no one doing that role and so we have no one fulfilling the statutorily required duties at this moment. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing and seeing none, uh, then I would ask for a motion. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I will make a motion to approve item number 15 as presented. Is there a second? I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Shepard and Ms. Jones. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Thank you all. Item 16. We have Angie Woods and Stephen Q. Miller. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, we got a little confusion going here. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I may. Oh, are you ready? Is that a ventriloquist trick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go, go that, ahead. That go ahead. Uh, actually, this is uh, kind of an opportunity to uh, share some of the work that has been done in the water arena um, through our uh, uh, PICWA organization. And then we have Terry Sue Rossi, who works for Arizona Water, who is uh, a co-vice chair of uh, the stakeholders group that I'm the chair of. So uh, we've performed a, um, uh, a modeling exercise that's kind of updated the model in Pinal County. Uh, it's been uh, very intense. There's a lot of good information here. It's probably going to be like drinking from a fire hose if, if at some point. But I would I'd ask that um, Terry Sue Rossi and and Joe Singleton from uh, do this presentation so you have an idea of all the work that has been done. And we were able to use. Uh, our, our association with PICWA as a pass-through, and it basically because the, the county did not have a, a contract with uh, Nathan Miller and his associates. Is that how his company's it, name is? It's, uh, there's Matrix New World and there's yeah. Westwater Research. Yeah. So we didn't have direct con uh, contracts there. PICWA does, so we're using PICWA as the pass-through, but PICWA was involved in all of this modeling exercise, and uh, I'll just turn it over to Terry Sue at this point if she'll uh, give us this, this presentation. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Board of Supervisors. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, as Steve indicated, I'm one of the co-vice chairs of the Pinal AMA Stakeholder Group. I, I'm also the Water Resource Manager for Arizona Water Company. And I'm going to go through some work that we've been doing since um, around October of uh, 2019 when we discovered that the groundwater model that's used to issue assured water supply determinations um, was determined to be uh, created some what we would refer to as unmet demands. But I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and kind of talk a little bit about modeling so that we're kind of all on the same um, page. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Is that how that works? <laughs> Oh, is that, that what this one does? Okay, is it the one to the right? Okay. 
Um, so I just want to begin by talking about what the Pinale made groundwater model is and really what any model is. It's really a, a conceptual representation of something in our world that we're trying to understand. And in this case, it's the groundwater aquifer, so the water beneath Pinal County that's located inside of what we refer to as the Eloy and the Maricopa Stanfield groundwater subbasins. So there's a large sub, or is there a large groundwater basin here called the Pinal AMA, and then within that are these two subbasins. Inside Pinal County, there's also another subbasin called the Phoenix AMA, and there's also one called the Tucson AMA. This particular study focuses in the Pinal AMA and specifically in those two subbasins, and that's where the vast majority of the assured water supply determinations are based. Um, and in addition to, to just sort of the, the general idea that it's a conceptual representation is that these models are filled with assumptions, hundreds of assumptions that are based on projected data, they're based on historic data, they're based on math equations, and they, these, this data and these um, equations just represent how hydrologists understand water moves vertically and horizontally in the ground. So you can imagine that these models are very complex. So to just make it a little more complex, the Department of Water Resources uses these models in order to uh, administer their regulatory program, which is the 100-year assured water supply program. So they run a package on top of this model that is called what we call the assured water supply assumptions. And that's all the assumptions that go into the idea of taking all of these determinations and running them out 100 years and making sure at the end of the 100 years there's still water left. And then if there is, then the Department of Water Resources will say, okay, we'll issue that certificate or that determination, or we won't. So that's kind of just the, the context for this discussion. So a little bit of history on the modeling. This is something the Department of Water Resources has done for decades. I actually worked for the Department of Water Resources in my first job and worked on the West Salt River Valley model, which is in the Phoenix AMA. The first Pinal AMA model was done in 1990. Uh, they, are, they are not updated frequently because it's a big effort. The next time it was uh, a major update was done was in 2014. Actually, one of our consultants found an error in that particular model in 2015. And at that point, essentially, while the department didn't say so, they stopped issuing determinations for assured water supply. And then they worked on repairing the model, and then they released the model again in October of 2019. In October of 2019... The results of that model revealed a, a, uh, a result that they declared, which was, is described as being 8 million acre feet of unmet demand. And an acre foot is, in this area, enough water to serve three to four housing units a year of water, to give you an idea. So, but that's over a 100-year period. So if you look at it from a, uh, on an annual basis, it's about 80,000 acre feet. Um, and then of that 8 million acre feet, approximately 5.5 million acre feet of it was associated with existing demands, and the vast majority of it is agriculture. And then less than a million acre feet of it is associated with municipal and industrial demands. And then about 2 million acre feet was associated with future assured water supply determinations. And the last little bit is associated with water that's been stored uh, underground for future use. The area where we were most concerned about is the 2 million acre feet that was associated with future assured water supply determinations. All right, so the, to give you an idea of kind of the seriousness of the problem, um, the last time a certificate of assured water supply was issued in the Pinal AMA was July 17th of 2011. The last time a designation of assured water supply was approved, which is an umbrella assured water supply status for an entire water provider, was in March of 2013. And the last time something called an analysis of assured water supply was approved was in August of 2015, which is sort of in between a designation and a certificate. Um, all during this time, the Department of Water Resources didn't really come out and say uh, directly that they were no longer issuing um, certificates. But finally, in, in June, of 20, June 28th of 2021, they officially announced that they would not approve any more determinations based on groundwater inside of the Pinal AMA model domain, <coughs> which is those two subbasins. And this had a, a significant ripple effect that really had started back in 2019 when we first realized 
you know, DEFCON 5, there's a problem. We have 8 million acre feet of, of unmet demand. And the department at the time would not release the model uh, for people to take, uh, lift up the hood and take a look at it. So uh, Mr. Miller was involved in putting together a stakeholder group along with Representative Cook that compelled the Department of Water Resources to release the model, which was huge. We couldn't have done anything relative to this issue without actually seeing the model. So Representative Cook created the Penale May Stakeholder Group. Um, Mr. Miller became the chairman. There were two vice, co-vice chairmen. Jake Lender came with, came with Global Water Resources and Bill Garfield with Arizona Water Company. And I replaced um, Bill this past fall in that capacity. But over the same period of time, I've been in charge of uh, taking care of all the review of the model, which I think is part, part of how I got that gig. <laughs> it wasn't a promotion. I think it was a, a voluntold kind of thing. Um, but the purpose of this group was really to figure out how to address those unmet demands. And we call it a lack of physically available groundwater. So when we say unmet demands, what we mean is that the model is saying there isn't enough actual groundwater to meet the demands of those assured water supply determinations. And so the purpose of the group was to review and make recommended changes to that groundwater model that was released in 2019 and to those assured water supply projections. And we were supposed to develop solutions to resolve the unmet demands associated with the assured water supply determinations. That was the 2 million acre feet and also solutions to bring renewable water supplies to the Pinal AMA. So that was the purpose of the stakeholder group. And uh, specifically, the, what we're going to talk about today is the recommended changes to the Penale May groundwater model and how that all came about. So the, the changes to the groundwater model are basically a series of recommended changes to assumptions. So they're basically numbers that we would then have them put into the model and rerun the model in order to get a different outcome. The Department of Water Resources, at the time that they released their model, told us that they were not interested in all the different people in the audience or their stakeholders giving individual requests. They wanted a single package that was agreed to by all of the stakeholders, and they wanted it to be provided at one time to the Department of Water Resources. They would then review that work and make a decision about what of those, what changes in there they would agree to, some or all of them. And so we had since been working to accomplish that, that goal. Bill Garfield at the time put together a modeling team, and this was just within Arizona Water Company that he put this modeling team together. So that was Bill, myself, and our two consultants, Matrix New World and Westwater Research. And we began working on this, um, on this project. But the, the, and I'm going to describe kind of it's been an evolution. But the final deliverables of this project uh, basically got down to several presentations that we did to stakeholders, uh, a phase one draft report. We are working on a final report that will be used to actually submit to the Department of Water Resources and an appendix that includes all the data supporting these changes. And these are, you know, if these were, uh, if this was on paper, it would be volumes of paper, but we all, we do it all digitally, of course. The goal of this project is to stabilize the regulatory environment, the assured water supply program environment, so that will allow business to continue to move forward uh, by, by, by mitigating those unmet demands associated with the municipal and the assured water supply demands in that model. So we're going to resolve those unmet demands so that new subdivisions can come forward and be approved, whether they're within the county or whether they're within a municipality and we can continue with business uh, in a rational manner. Um, and then what will happen is once that model is available, then people in the community can use that model to apply for their hydrologic studies that support their assured water supply determinations. Oops. So kind of the way this happened, and, I, and I, I mentioned earlier that things have kind of evolved, so this was a little bit like eating a very large elephant. And so we kind of took little bites here and there and eventually kind of came to the point of where we could put together this entire package. And as uh, Mr. Miller pointed out, uh, Pinal County Water Augmentation Authority and Arizona Water Company have been very involved in doing a, a number of studies that have gotten us to the point of where we could do this final package. So we did an initial review of the model. That was Arizona Water Company right out of the shot, uh, right out of the chute took care of that. Global helped us with a little bit of that. 
Then the Pinal Partnership did a little deeper dive into the issues that we discovered in the initial review. Arizona Water Company and what we call PICWA uh, did a groundwater modeling and well field optimization study. Arizona Water Company did it at its uh, water planning area, and then PICWA did that same study at an expanded area. We gave them our work, and they built upon that. And then they also did some what we would call target -wide, uh, targeted model-wide optimization. So they were doing some improvements to deal with some of the pockets where there were problems. And then the other thing we did was we looked at the demands associated with the San Carlos Irrigation and Drainage District, and we improved those in the model. And all of that work amounted to about $220,000 worth of work and the various parties paying for those amounts. And all of that work was really necessary for us to get to the point where we could finally put this package together for the Department of Water Resources. So the final package is as described here. It was conducted in two, two different phases, uh, phase one and phase two. Phase two was completed. We had five uh, elements in the model that we then tested our assumptions against. And at the end of the phase one model, we were able to... <laughs> we were able to demonstrate that we could eliminate all the unmet demands, and we came to the stakeholder group, we presented those results, and we got feedback from them that a num number of other things needed to be done in order for us to move the package forward. So we entered into what we call the phase two of the modeling study. And in phase two, we needed to do some additional updates, including... Uh, as you might recall, the model was published in 2019. It was based on 2015 data, so we updated it to 2020, for example. We looked at some impacts of higher pumping levels in what we would call vulnerable areas. Uh, we had a number of meetings with stakeholders who were affected by the new modeling, and then we incorporated new and pending well locations, and then we reran all of our elements, and we iterated out all of the unmet demands once more. And then on... Uh, February 14th, we presented the results of the Phase two study, and we were once again able to eliminate the unmet demands. Whoops, I went one too many. Um, so the, the status of the project right now is that the modeling is now complete. We have presented the final results to the stakeholders. We have resolved the unmet demands, and we're preparing the final product for the Department of Water Resources. That product will be, will be reviewed by the leadership team, including Mr. Miller and Mr. Lunderking, and then we will transmit the final product to the Department of Water Resources in mid-March as our target at this point. And this is a map of the results. And, the, and, and, if, you, and if you want to know a lot more about the actual modeling, we want to bring our modelers by and show you the actual details of it. But this is an example of an output. And in this map, while it's, it's probably hard to tell, we were able to <laughs> resolve all of the unmet demands. There was a... Um, an area down in the southeast part where the groundwater levels were dropping lower than we would like them to be, but that will not prevent assured water supply determinations from moving forward in other parts of the of the Pinal AMA. Um, so that's kind of the, the high-level results. And again, if you want to learn more about that, we would need to have a totally different presentation to focus on that. So uh, another thing that happened at the at the last meeting is that we had uh, a number of parties had come to specifically to Arizona, actually to the president of our company, and had um, suggested that it would be um, not only appropriate but important to the stakeholders to contribute to the final package. And uh, to at at that point, the Arizona Water Company had been paying for most of the costs, and we were willing to do that. But people felt that in order for them to have access to that information in order for them to feel like they have some control in their lives that they needed to contribute to the package. Um, and I think that, uh, that, in, that Steve also felt that it was important for the county to contribute because this is a countywide effort and the county has taken a significant role in leading this effort. And so, um, by example, I, I believe he decided that it was important to contribute to, uh, to the study as well. So these entities all agreed to contribute to the final study. And the purpose of today's meeting is to seek approval of the payment for the county's contribution. And so then the way that that, that has been arranged, I think Steve was alluding to that earlier, is that PICWA will be providing a special assessment to the county for the $25,000.
Uh, we, uh, Arizona Water Company is also a member of PICWA, and we've entered into a letter agreement with PICWA to, upon receipt of that uh, special assessment, that we would then use that money to pay for some of the consulting bills in the last phase of the project. Um, and then the other, the, the other payments are going to be made directly to Matrix New World because they have a direct relationship with those other entities. So that's, that's the purpose of today's meeting, and I think that's my last slide. And so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And Joe, Joe is also here to answer questions. He's the executive director of, of PICWA. And the PICWA board has also already talked about this matter. Thank you, Ms. Rossi. Uh, Supervisor Miller. I just uh, just add one little caveat to uh, uh, you pay to play <laughs> kind of thing. We, yeah. we have access now to the model. It shows right. that the county is, is uh, supportive of this. And I think it's really important to understand that we did get a commitment, verbal commitment, from the Department of Water Resources to allow us to present all this modeling to the department to go forward and look at it. Uh, it that's that's going to be like the, the the final step in this thing, and there's a lot of information. Of course, they have modelers and people that understand all that. So I'm looking forward to the middle of March. But I it gives it gives Pinal County it shows com, Pinal County's committed to resolving this issue. Mm -hmm. Our staff can use this and in, in, for information going forward in, in the entirety. And so, anyway, I, I just think it's very important that the county has a position of uh, need uh, to have this kind of information available. Yeah, and, and the other thing is that all the assured water supply determinations that are issued outside of a municipality in the county are all dependent upon the success of this model, existing and future. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Good. Wow. Good. That's okay, right. All right. Well, let's see then. So for number 16, I would ask for a motion. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve a number, item number 16 as presented. Is there a second? I'll second, second it. Is that four? <laughs> two and two. Okay. So let's see. We've got, we've got a motion and a second. So in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman? Uh, y yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, there will be more presentations in the future. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Tune in. Joe, thank you for your help. This, is, this does kind of validate the reason we should keep PICWA around, too, because they're doing another study on, on brackish water and those types of things. So w we have a lot of stuff going on here. Um, but... Um, and don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have questions going forward. So thank well, you. I appreciate being in on the meetings. <laughs> There's a lot of information. A lot of information. Just, <laughs> thank all you. right. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kavanaugh. I move for a five-minute recess. <laughs> I can almost understand that. I, okay, we are in recess for five minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah. We don't need to move anything. It's oh. just like we're out of here. We still say. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's move on here. We are back in session again. And uh, number 17, we have, uh, we have uh, what do we have? Discussion, approval, disapproval, resolution number 022322, CHIPS. And that would be Mr. Goodman is the presenter on this one. Uh, Supervisor Goodman, I'm uh, sorry. Well, that's all right. But thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, this is something that uh, over the, and many of us, and I, it, Supervisor Surdy brought up something earlier about vehicles and, and the cost of vehicles and where they're, they're escalating to, and a lot of it is the supply chain, and in particularly these microchips, these chips that are put into it. There's, there's a very lack of these items, and so, and one of the things that's pretty well known is here in Arizona, we've had quite a few interests of some of these chip industries, and some of them have been approved and they're doing it, but we have other ones that are wanting to come forward and do some things here. And as I've looked into this and looked into it a little bit further, um, 
it seems to be at the federal level that this particular item is a nonpartisan and everybody's in agreement. <coughs> but like all other bills, there seems to be some hold up on it because they want to attach some of these things to these good bills so that they can get participation from other individuals and which is in their opinion is good government to me that's bad government especially in something this vital and this importance because we're having to use outside of our country and import these things when we have the capability and everything to produce this stuff right here not only in our own country but in our own state and there's a demand and a need for it and we have the capability of doing that and so in asking for uh, CSA to, to do something like this they wanted to put it on an agenda item you know we've led the way in so many different things here at Pinal County and this is something that I felt was a need that we can lead the way again for all other counties and even some of our and and encourage our state legislators to get behind this as well as our congressional leaders and so this was, this was, as talking to some of our staff, this was what I felt was probably the best way to go about doing it. So that, that's the resolution. Just, whatever he said, just type it all down. That's great. <laughs> it's recorded, so. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Uh, do I have uh, any questions? No. Do we, do we have the resolution there? Maybe we could read it. We could let Mr. Goodman read it because he just wants to. Oh. You want me to be animated on it? Yeah. Wave your arms. Okay. Oh, it's going to have to be bigger. <laughs> Here, I know what to do. There we go. Okay. A resolution of the Pinal County Board of Supervisors to urge the Arizona Congressional Delegation and U.S. Congress to swiftly fund the semiconductor manufacturing programs authorized in the Creating Healthful Incentives for the Production of Semiconductors for America Act, CHIPS. Whereas the Board of Supervisors of Pinal County recognizes <coughs> the importance of regional economic development and whereas the Board of Supervisors of Pinal County recognizes the significant and growing role that the semiconductor industry plays in our county and the state of Arizona, and whereas current and expected growth in the semiconductor industry in Pinal County and state of Arizona will create thousands of new jobs and generate billions of dollars in economic growth in the county and state, and whereas for economic and national security reasons, it is imperative for the United States to rapidly increase domestic semiconductor manufacturing and create a more resilient supply chain. And whereas the U.S. Congress is currently considering legislation to fund implementation of the CHIPS Act, which will address severe shortages in the semiconductor supply chain and enhance conditions for further semiconductor development and growth in Pinal County and the state of Arizona. Whereas the Board of Supervisors of Pinal County recognizes the importance of timely congressional passage of CHIPS funding for Pinal County and Arizona's economic future. Whereas to avoid further delay, Congress should advance legislation focused on funding for CHIPS implementation and be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Pinal County hereby urges the Arizona Congressional Delegation and U.S. Congress to swiftly pass legislation to fund implementation of CHIPS. Approved this uh, 23rd day of February 2022 and attested by our Pinal County Board of Supervisors. And one more thing I'd like to add. This would be a great birthday present for me, brethren. Would it? Oh, <laughs> there we go. All right. We're going to sing in a minute. Okay, so, uh, all right, so we, we have the resolution. We have it even read to us. Do I, have a, do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I would move that we approve item 17 as presented. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Oppose? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you very much, and happy birthday to you. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Is it this you? your birthday today? No, it's the Sunday, but hey. Oh. Every day's birthday for Every me. day's a birthday for you. <laughs> See, birthday. You know, when you get my age, it's every day that month. You do birthday, oh, birthday months? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right, item, jeez. <laughs> Uh, let's see, item number 18. This is a discussion approval dis disapproval to repeal resolution number 032020, uh, local state of emergency. And this is Supervisor Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, a couple of years ago, Chairman Anthony Smith was uh, and the board approved emergency declarations in light of the rapidly evolving situation with COVID. Um, it is not is no longer rapidly evolving. There is no need for um, an emergency declaration. Um, our funding is not impacted by, uh, to my understanding, impacted by um, moving to regular business or regular order. Um, there was a couple of concerns brought to my attention by County Attorney Chris Keller, and he could address those. I didn't know if you wanted uh, me to address those now or if you wanted to continue on. Uh, essentially, there were some concerns, uh, you know, whether it would affect funding, as Supervisor Kavanaugh had suggested. Uh, to let the board know, uh, two other counties have already uh, rescinded theirs. Uh, Mojave County rescinded theirs, I believe, in November of last year of 21. And I believe either uh, July or August of last year, uh, Pima County also had rescinded their emergency resolution also. Uh, as a result, you know, we had kept this in place uh, to give us some flexibility uh, regarding some overtime situations for certain employee groups, uh, specifically related to the sheriff's office and the like that, that don't have the ability to, to be off of work, you know, uh, for as long as other entities or other departments uh, should they be hit and impacted with COVID. Uh, but because of the, the decrease and so forth and checking with the sheriff's office, uh, they are comfortable with rescinding this at this time also. Uh, as far as uh, the time frame, this was adopted in almost two years ago. Uh, it was adopted March 20th of 2020 is when the board previously adopted this. And essentially what it did do is provide the chairman the ability to rule by proclamation on certain things, such as curfews, closing businesses, public access to buildings and the like, uh, auxiliary, calling up auxiliary law enforcement and the things. Uh, those are things that the chairman had the ability to do without formally having to have a board action on it. However, your resolution at that time uh, required the board, should the chairman take any of those actions, to come back before this board within three days to uh, approve that. Uh, none of those actions uh, were necessary during that time period. Uh, so that's about all I could add at this point. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Right, Ms. Spears, would you, Dr. Spears, would you please come up and just give us kind of an update on COVID? <coughs> Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> um, good morning, uh, Chairman McClure, Vice Chair Surdy, Board members, uh, Tasha Spears, Public Health. Um, thank you for inviting me to give an update. Um, I can tell you that um, as of this morning, we did see a decrease, certainly in the case count with regard to COVID cases. Um, you know, with Omicron, we initially um, started to see a trend upwards with <coughs> confirmed cases. Um, and those were actually exceeding over 1,000 a day. And I can tell you, as of this morning, the daily confirmed uh, count was 81. Um, we did see a decrease in hospitalizations um, as well as fatalities over time, um, and that's based on multiple factors. So, um, <coughs> you know, with regard to this current um, item being discussed, <clears throat> I think that um, it's important to recognize that rescinding this order <clears throat> in no way diminishes like the shades of suffering that occurred over the past two years. 
Um, but we also recognize that we cannot live in a state of perpetual COVID crisis. Um, so, you know, as a public health department, we are committed to promoting health uh, and healthy practices and continuing to, to serve the community with regard to all types of responses, not only to COVID, but other infectious communicable diseases, but also focus on health prevention as well. So I'm not sure if you had specific questions about COVID or... <clears throat> no, just no. an update that we're seeing a downward trend and that's, yes. that's good and we can't yes. live in forever fear, so... Yes. Are, are and of course we can't predict the COVID future, um, but, you know, we um, certainly take measures as we can and assist um, all individuals and communities as we can. And the good news is we're seeing less severe presentations of the disease. Um, so I think, you know, it's important to recognize those positive um, factors as well. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Birthday Boy Goodman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the one question I have is in regards to any of the funding that occurs from this particular, from on the COVID <coughs> issues, uh, we're, we still do testing and all that, right? Is there still, or would we still be eligible to get some of the funding for testing no matter what? Okay. Okay, that was something that I was a little bit unclear of, and so I'm, I'm hearing yes on that. that. That is correct. We did take a look at uh, multiple of the prior uh, agreements that the board has approved, you know, to accept funding or grants and the like. Yeah. Uh, none of them were contingent on having a declared state of emergency. Okay. Yeah, and if I could continue. You may. Yeah, and I appreciate what you're saying, that it's time to move on. In, in, a, in a way, I mean, and we can't afford to continue to live in the fear of all of this. So anyway, that's one of the things that uh, I'll be supporting this. Okay, thank you. Are there any, are Terry. there any, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think the optics of this with, with what's going on, we, we need to do exactly the opposite of whatever Canada's doing. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> no offense, Tosh. Uh, so this was put into place before a couple of us were seated. And I don't see Chairman McClure doing anything nefarious or negative. But let's say this was, and, uh, and he chose something, how could, could this board override him if we did not like an executive decision that he made? You're going to have to fight my knights. <laughs> three days. You, three fight days. my knights. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Surdy, uh, with the current resolution that's in place, should the sitting chairman do something nefarious or something that the rest of the board did not like, you know, took an action, the, the way this was structured was the board had to approve and or ratify that action within three days. So if the board decided that wasn't appropriate, they would just vote it down and it would just be uh, canceled at that point in time. Okay. So that, that's the way it was put in place. Yeah. Thank you. And then we'd have a jousting match. <laughs> All right. I, I, I so, like the, so okay, well, I, I think that does it. So, any other comments? Questions? So, do we, this is not an action item. How do we make this happen? Actually, it, it is. It says discussion okay. approval, disapproval. Okay. So, approve the re so, the action is, the action is, do I have a motion? Chairman. Ma'am. You should have a card for Roberto to see. No, no we, we've already, oh, okay. we've fixed that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Spears. Thank you. Okay, do I have a motion? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number 18 as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes. I am going to take some liberty here, and I'm going, since we're going to executive session in a bit, I would move item 20 up to this position. And is there anything that anyone from the board would like to have on a future agenda? Oh, oh! I, I heard my that. Screen. Hang on a second. Yes, Mr. Chairman. 
Supervisor Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first item um, that I would like to request a report and discussion item for the 2nd of March from the county manager providing a report to the Board of Employee Turnover by Department, the likely cause of turnover and what can be uh, done to address it. The second item would be to establish a regular audit schedule departments and agencies so that all members of the public can be confident that resources are being used wisely and no commingling of public and private funds is occurring. This would not only allow us to put to rest the issues brought up earlier in this meeting, but put us on a more regular schedule and reporting of financial accountability to the public. My re request will be that the schedule of review and audit begin with the department or agency with the largest expenditures and work our way down to the agencies or departments with the smallest budget and so on. Um, I would ask for a public explanation from the county manager of how financial audits and reporting presently occurs. Uh, our failure to track, properly track income and expenditures was highlighted last year when we realized that a lease for real property was not properly tracked over a period of years and the taxpayers were denied approximately 200,000 in resources promised in the lease. So my request is for a discussion item on March 2nd, 2022, to understand our current practices and establish a framework for financial audits if one does not already exist. Okay, thank you. You got all that. And any other items? Supervisor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't know if this is really an item, but it is a concern of mine, and maybe because I'm too close to the action of the state legislature and where uh, a lot of legislation is going and maybe where Pinal County would stand on some of that. And that might be maybe a more um, uh, 2 two, one kind of conversations with the, the, the uh, county manager and legal. I, I do represent... The, you know the board at the LPC at the uh, 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 as far as uh, the legislation going through, some of them are more specific to uh, Pinal County, and I think they should be looked at maybe a little bit closer. I don't know really how to structure that. I don't know that it necessarily needs to be an agenda item right now, but I think conversations and discussion about the legislation. Uh, from my colleagues needs to uh, to weigh in on some of that and better understand where we might stand on some of that legislation. Okay, so you'd suggest a two, two, and one yeah. at this point with and staff, then bring, bring and it then, later? Yeah, and, uh, I'll try and I flag some of the, the legislation that I think is more specific to Pinal County. All right, thank you. So not an agenda item yet? Not an agenda item, but okay. something that we need to talk about. Any, any other items? Hearing none. All right. Uh, then we, I guess we will, uh, let's see, I need a motion to convene to executive session. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we go into executive session. Is there a second? Second. In favor? Aye. 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 We are in executive session. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Aye. Aye. Excellent. In that case, meeting adjourned. Yeah, this is left the building, baby.